So I'm going to read a few words about uh, Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm was born in Brooklyn, in New York. He's a composer, a violinist, and improviser who has been active in the presentation of new music and dance since the early 60s. He received an MA in music composition from Columbia University that we were mentioning today in the 60s, uh, having studied with um, Otto Dunning that we also mentioned before. In the 60s in New York City, he was co-founder with James Tenney and Philip Corner of the Tone Roads Ensemble and was a participant in the Judson Dance Theater, the New York Festival of the Avant-Garde and the Experimental Intermedia Foundation. Since then, uh, Malcolm was uh, touring extensively throughout North America and Europe with solo concerts as well as with new music and dance ensembles. In fact, Malcolm was telling me that next week he was he's leaving to, for a number of concerts during one month in France and Germany. His soundings, that's a uh, name, improvisations, have received international acclaim for having reinvented violin playing, extending the range of tonal sound texture possibilities of the instrument and revealing new dimensions of expressivity. And since the mid uh, 60s, he has integrated structure improvisation aspects into his composition, exploring the rich sound texture of new performance techniques within a variety of instrumental and vocal framework. So, um, as I told you before, even if uh, Malcolm doesn't have a Facebook page, uh, doesn't have a web page, I told you he exists, he's very famous, and he has been playing with uh, a lot of people all around the world, so I'm very happy that we, we have uh, Malcolm here. Thank you for coming. Um, well, I mean, out of what I was reading here, he's going to talk a little bit also about his experiences with electronic music in the early 60s, and in particular, um, his work also with the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center that we were mentioning today. So, thank you, Malcolm, welcome. Uh, so Ricardo also didn't say that I don't have a computer. <laughs> I see everybody has their own uh, thing here. So. Um, okay. Probably everything you refer to, you don't, you don't know anything about. You don't know about tone roads. You don't know about the Justin Dance Theory, right? Anybody know anything? Sure, that's normal. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's not get into that. We'll get into that maybe later. Uh, so I went to Columbia University. And I got my master's there somewhere about 1959, 86, I can't remember. Uh, my first uh, job was actually with the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Studio. And uh, uh, Ricardo mentioned uh, Otto Lunin and Vladimir Uzyshevsky. Um But you should know that at that time there was a very, uh, I guess I would say powerful, if that's the right word, musicologist who said this is not music. So everything you're doing is not music. <laughs> um, his name is Paul Henry Lang. You don't know him, that's good. Um, so there were actually, they didn't even have a studio. When uh, Lang professed all this nonsense, uh, they were given, or they got hold of, I don't know if they were given, a, a room in the caretaker's cottage, which doesn't exist now. So there was a small house right on the corner of 116, 114th Street and Broadway. And all they had were a few tape decks. Uh, I brought this. <laughs> I happen to have it. This is what we worked with. <laughs> this is magnetic tape. Uh, just trying to get this off here. This is leader tape, usually made out of paper. And then there's no sound on that. And then becomes the magnetic tape. And you, you see back there's a diagonal splice. Well, there's two kinds. I, I was looking for my splicing block. I kept it for some, I can't find it uh, somewhere, uh, sentimental reasons. There's two basic kinds of cuts. One is diagonal, 
and the other is very vertical. Diagonal gives you a softer articulation. You go into the sound, and the other gives you a very abrupt articulation. It was all very, very manual. And this also says tails out. Can you guess why? Almost impossible. Well, if, if you're, if this is magnetic. You're, you're imprinting a tape. So there's two sides. One's the plastic uh, backing, and the other is magnetic uh, material embedded in the material. And if you had that face to face, what would you guess might happen? It would get erased. Wouldn't erase, no. You, after time, especially with loud sounds, you might start imprinting and you might then get a, uh, another layer of sound. It'd be very slight, but um, if you were concerned about purity, then you know, with tails out, then it's just the, the mylar, the plastic against the plastic, and then you're more safe. But it's all very, very impermanent. Even, you know, it's like um, CD recordings, compact discs. They're not going to last forever also. They, after all, disintegrate. So I'll get into that later, but like I have, I made recordings also later. They've worked in the uh, West German radio station with certain pieces. And they have to periodically re-record onto this kind of tape, because if you put it on the, onto the compact disc, you really can't do anything with it unless you put it on another compact disc. So everything is impermanent. Um, even these machines, they're going to, Probably, I don't know how much uh, that cost you and when you bought it, but maybe in the next few years, it'll be useless, right? <laughs> this is part of the business. Anyway, so I started working for the studio there, at, and uh, by then they, they were able to get a small room, which is probably about the size of this. That was the Electronic Music Studio of Columbia. Columbia. And my job was uh, sort of a catch-all kind of job. It was working with composers. I was working uh, with uh, the, uh, the library of other, other places that had made their music, um, and just whatever was needed. Uh, you probably know about music concrete, yes? And you know about electronic, electronische music. So there's the French out of Paris with uh, Pierre Schaeffer and Pierre Henry, and then there's electronic music out of Germany. They're pretty... Um, not rigidly so, but pretty much like music concrete is a whole um, stamp of, of what that means. Yeah, and electronic music is working with electronic sources. Music concrete, you're taking sounds from the environment or, or pre recorded sounds. And uh, then there's the area in between, and that's what we were sort of working more with. But what you're working with is at that time is a tape recorder. So we had like three good quality, or maybe four good quality tape recorders, like big, made in Switzerland or Germany. And then for the sources of sound, if you wanted to work with electronic sounds, there were generators, just small boxes, that were generated sine waves. You all know sine waves, right? If anybody doesn't know anything, just stop me and say, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I don't want to be interrupted. And then, uh, so it'd be a science square wave generator. And also, um, oh, I've got a uh, sawtooth, you know? So maybe two or three of those. Then for echo, uh, you, you could also do it electronically. But they would even have a box that was about the length of this and about the width of that. And you would send your sound into that box and then you would pull something which would make a baffle, more echo or less echo. And then so you get the sound coming in and you record the sound going out. It was all very, very rudimentary. And you would do it by ear. This, this, you know, this, there was no measurement. So everything was very, very physical. Um, and uh, the process was really uh, uh, more exploration. There was one person, uh, you know, named Wendy Carlos. 
Okay, good. Hey. <laughs> well, he, she was very uh, determined for a precision of uh, exactitude, so um, it was more pain because <laughs> this is not so exacting. There's a story that Cage tells with a piece that he did with Earl Brown. It was actually Cage's mm -hmm. piece, but splicing. So when you splice, uh, it's a block. Well, the bit, this one in the studio was larger about this. The one I had was smaller. It's a cut like that and a cut like that. You know? But if you close this eye and cut, that's one thing. Especially you can do with the scissors, too. And you close your other eye. So they were always getting imprecise uh, measurements because one closed one eye, one closed the other eye. <laughs> um, this, is like, this is a kind of uh, imp improvisational kind of thing that went on. You, but you could be, there are people who worked very, very intensively, like there was a composer who's not known now, I'm surprised. His name is Gulent Arel. He was from Turkey originally. Um, and then he moved to the United States and he no, moved. He was a, one of the students who was presenting something a little bit about him. So He's what? One of the students was making a presentation recently, just very briefly, oh, talking fantastic. about the uh, beauty. Fantastic. Yeah. Who did that? Who did Gulent Arel? No, he's not here. Oh, that class, okay. Yeah, he was a fantastic composer. I think he's dead now. Um, he worked very, very, very uh, hard. Uh, so very often, since the, the studio, you're going to have one person at a time, he would work into the nighttime. And the other people like Mario Davidovsky, he worked more in the daytime. And uh, I worked with Varez, and Varez came in the, the daytime. I worked just a couple of sessions with him. Uh, so everybody was like just using that very, very uh, limited time in the studio. Everything was done by uh, cut and splice. So anything, if you wanted to make any kind of a, a complicated texture, you had to just record something, cut it, and this seven and a half inches per second, so you knew, you measured time not by a clock, but by a distance. Or if you wanted higher quality, you would go your s the speed of your machine at 15 inches per second. So that means you're recording faster so that you get a more um, uh, higher quality sound. But you had to decide when you were working with which. It's hard to switch back and forth. And, uh, and in the process also, you have to re-record and re-record, which you don't do with your machines. Uh, you do that, after a while, if you do it too much, you start to uh, degrade the sound. So all these things were part of this uh, process of improvisation. Um, then, I think it was about 1959 or so, when, uh, so the uh, uh, Uzhyshevsky and Lunin were not well, they re respected as professors of music, but their music was not respected by the music department until, I think it was 1959 or something like that, or 58. Uh, from, I think it was uh, Rockefeller and someone else, big fa rich foundations, they funded a project with Columbia and Princeton to come together to build, uh, I believe at that time in, in a university, the first uh, computer generator sound studio. And that was built not at 116th Street, but up at 125th Street. I was not involved with that. I, just, I did everything, so my job was just to, to build the carpentry stuff for that. But I do remember uh, uh, Milton Babbitt. Uh, he was a composer who taught at Princeton, and he was very into 12-tone uh, music. You all know what that is, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, so very, very precise. And so with the first analog computer, so you want to sound like boo. Well, you type in bo. You know, the articulation, duration, boo. The tonal material, uh, the loudness. You type in all of the parameters of the sound, and then you go home. And then two days you come back and you get boo. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Babbitt was very patient, <laughs> so you ended up building up a whole piece. And then I think it was 59 or 60, I can't remember. Uh, that there was the first presentation that included uh, Ludin, Ruzhevsky, Davidovsky, uh, Babbitt, 
Warnin, Howie Meldob. I think that was it. I was just a sound engineer, so I didn't do anything. I just worked with it. Yeah. Uh, actually, I wasn't even interested in electronic music at all. I'm a composer. Works. Uh, I work. A lot of my work is with sound texture. Um, and even the way I play the violin, it's not just simple tonal, but really working with qualities and textures and noise and everything. And I was just interested in working with people with instruments. So I took the job just as a job. So uh, later I did some pieces, but it's not my main interest. So the, the work at the uh, analog computer lab was one thing, and the work at the other studio was something else. And then that, the two just went on that way. So maybe uh, right now I'll just skip to, anybody have any questions about that time? No? OK. Uh, I'll just skip to something. Uh, this is, OK, uh, no, I'll maybe go before I just give you a framework. So uh, Ricardo mentioned uh, the Judson Dance Theater. Uh, that Judson, it was, the name came from the Judson Memorial Church. Uh, if you've been down to New York City, you probably know it, Washington Square Park in the village. And it's a church on the south side of the, of the uh, park. And the minister was like, uh, to say he was radical was putting it mildly. So every, I think it was either Saturday or Sunday, there'd be discussions on politics, including about abortion. Um, and then also um, uh, there was the, uh, the theater, which they did all kinds of experimental theater, like uh, Gertrude Stein, which you might know or might not know, but say sound text poetry. Um, uh, and then also out of uh, Merce Cunningham's company and with John Cage, then a few dancers got together and had a workshop with one of the musicians that worked with Cage. And then they went to the church and said, could we do our work here? So the Judson Dance Theater, was uh, originally founded by several dancers who had worked with Cunningham and Cage. And do you know about Cage and Cunningham a little bit? Mm -hmm. You understand that their work is predicated upon chance procedures. Yeah? So uh, their first work was working like with that. And then other people, after the first performance, I said, well, I like it. I'll join. Other people joined. And some people went in and out. And what was important uh, for me in that is that that was the first time I began with improvisation. I'm a trained classical violinist. So. But uh, this is where nothing was open improvisation that I can remember. It was all structural improvisation. Uh, it was also very involved with uh, very common things. Like, uh, I don't know what your image of dance is. It's not ballet. It's not even modern dance. It's how people walk, how people fall, how people run, etc. Uh, so a lot of it is just, I guess you could say mundane in the sense that it was daily activity, but made into dance structures. Uh, you would not see any ballet there at all. Uh, even, not even the more um, controlled techniques of Merce Cunningham, which also in a way relates to ballet. And in that situation, uh, the dancers would just simply say to the musicians involved, could you do some music for us? It wasn't music which was one-to-one, -one, like if I did boom, they didn't do boom. No, they're just doing something and my boom might come in the midst of it. And so at that time, uh, I think the first thing I did, uh, I'd done something before for uh, another situation. But the first thing I did, I think the dancer asked me for, uh, she liked uh, some, I think it was Turkish folk music, some uh, Guillaume de Machaut, you know Guillaume de Machaut? OK, it's great. He's from the 14th century France, fantastic composer. Uh, and uh, the, uh, from uh, Bach, here comes, there comes, the da da da. I can't remember which one it is, one of the cantatas. 
and then anything else I wanted to throw in there. So we'll listen to that later. But um, everything I did at that time was for the dance. And they would simply say, could you do that? Just like a uh, different story, a dancer asked me for, could you get together a string quartet and do the string quartet of Christian Wolf? Christian Wolf is also a friend of John Cage's, and it's a very complicated notation. It's not notes, it's more relationships. And so uh, I said, sure, never having played good music before, and I studied it. And then they got together a quartet and we did it. And that, that was sort of like the sound environment in which then the dance took place. It wasn't a one-to-one -one relationship. And so this was the kind of work we worked with. And uh, improvisation was uh, commonplace, but it wasn't open improvisation. It was always within a framework of uh, focus. So uh, this, is, this is for dancer uh, Ruth Emerson. It's all made up of electronic sounds. I'll begin with that first. You can hear it's, maybe it's maybe it's closer to what you do. Um, you will hear though it's a lot of kind of stuff. It's all cut and splice and cut and splice and cut and splice. And it's very small cut and splice. And in time, um, like by now, I don't have the original anymore. Uh, all those splices just become all the glue comes out and. That's it. <laughs> so you make another recording. So maybe if we can yeah. put that one on this. So, it's it's number two. Yeah. so I think this is even called. That's this. 19. This is 1965. This is Judson. Oh, it's called Judson number six because it was the sixth in the series of the dance of the of the evenings of dance. So 1965. Judson Dance Theater began about 1962. And by about 1960-something, 67, 66, and so Thank mm -hmm. you. 
haven't heard this yeah. almost since then. <laughs> <laughs> so I was about 29 when I get there, I guess. So. Okay, here's quite a simple form from this kind of stuff to this stuff to this stuff, and then this coda with this long tongue here. Um, so it's a very traditional kind of uh, ABA form with a coda. I never thought about that when I did it. <laughs> I just I listened to it. I said, oh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you can hear some very simple techniques, too. The, the loudness is simply as uh, having this, uh, okay, oh, it's got different techniques. You can make, a, you, you can do it also loops, yeah? I remember Stockhausen, he wanted a really long loop. I, I didn't know him personally. But, um, so we'd have a pole here, and then the tape would be going like this, in and out by the heads of the, of the tape recorder, and you get your loop. Well, what you do also then is you control, so you go, yeah, so you can actually make a crescendo by recording it with, a, with your hand on the record the knob. Yeah? Um, also, you can hear, uh, I can hear anyway, as I'm feeding the more uh, staccato material into the big black box, I'm just changing the baffle, so you're getting from a, for a kind of a much more uh, blended kind of sound. They're all, so and also playing the sound backwards. Play the sound backwards, and you get a whole different attack. Rather than ba, you get ah. These are all simple techniques that we played with. Uh, I don't, don't know anything about your technology now. <laughs> so, but it was all very, very <coughs> physical, and you're just sort of trying, trying to sound and say, oh, that works here, and I'll do that here, and um, cutting and splicing, that was the whole thing. Um, so this is uh, the first electronic thing. Um, if, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd like to go just even to go to something even more. Um, no, that's over here. Yeah, we'll go to this next one. Uh, this will be even more crude. Not actually, I like it better as a piece. Um, it's, it's called. No, it's the same. It's the same. It's number three. Same too. Number okay. three. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is called Sheep Meadow. It's called Sheep Meadow because um, in Central Park is a place called Sheep Meadow, mm -hmm. and um, there was a demonstration against the Vietnamese War. So this, I think, was 1967 or something like that. I don't know. And uh, I'm sure you don't know the Volensack machine. Not many body people. Volensack is from Germany. Machine like this, it's a, you can carry it. The ones in the studio you couldn't carry. They're really heavy, well-made. This is a very cheap machine. The sound here is made up of two sources, a Korean folk song. Uh, I didn't have any access to uh, Vietnamese. So it's a recording which I made from an from a old-fashioned disc, which now we're selling for a lot of money, yeah, um, of a Korean folk song on a flute, solo flute, and a Korean court song. And when you hear the sound breaks up, uh, <laughs> kind of thing, it's simply that on the Volensack, if you recorded the sound, so I recorded from a disc onto the Volensack, yeah? So I recorded first the song by itself. I can't remember now, I'm making this up. But I learned that if you record it, if you put the volume up so loud, the machine just shatters the sound. It's fantastic. That's the whole technique of the whole thing. I didn't do anything, and I just simply cut out from the recording what I wanted, spliced it together, and made the piece. So it's a relationship of the uh, court song to the folk song, uh, with all of the um, tech, uh, low technology of the Volensack machine itself. And I just cut and paste it together. Yes. About the first piece. Sure. Uh, what were the sound sure. You Just louder, please. What were the sound sources you used in the first? Oh, whew, I don't remember. Uh, the sound <laughs> like was a square wave. It, it's, it's a lot of pitches, yeah. Okay. So oh, a, a square. Oh, also, I'm sorry, I left out one thing. It was also a bandpass filter, so you could filter. This and say if you had once you built up a certain uh, a, a sine wave, a, a sine wave generator, a square wave, etc., gives you only one frequency. So if you want a complex thing, you have to 
re-record, re-record, I'm sorry, record, 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 paste them all together to make a complex, like all the sounds in the world are complex sounds. If I play a sound on the violin, there are thousands of sound in that one sustained tone, yeah? Um, so then say you had something, whatever your source was, and you wanted to uh, bring out certain frequencies within that or cut out certain frequencies. So the, then that's called a, a filter, band fast pass filter. You get certain bands. Uh, so to answer your question, I don't know. This is a long time ago. <laughs> that's 1965. <laughs> Sometimes, okay. Um, I'm sure there were, I can hear that there are uh, square waves in there. There are, uh, yeah, ah, that's a square wave. That's not a sine wave. Mainly square waves and some sine waves. And sometimes build up to several thicknesses and sometimes more simple. Yeah. You know? It's, it's a, was basically electronic, not concrete sources. This is not concrete at all. This is all electronic. That one you just heard is all uh, electronic. It, uh, it's not, I'm sure it's not what you're doing now, but it's uh, closer since you're working with, elect with your machines. Yeah? This, though, is completely, except for the, the poor technology, which for me is very exciting. When I say we were, we were at the Just Dance there, um, the inspiration was the world that we live in, rather than making <coughs> art, which is like um, most people think of as separate from the world we live in. Um, this is like working with uh, uh, the way we move. And for me, uh, uh, like, you know Varese's music, yeah? Okay, Varese, he was criticized. Uh, it's not music. It's always that way. If you want to read an interesting book, you read a book by uh, Slonimsky. He put together uh, the historical and vectors of music, even going back to Monteverdi, where Monteverdi was told by the critics at that time, this is poor, you know, you, you're, you're doing your distances all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> To criticize Monteverdi takes a lot of guts, but maybe at that time it was simpler. And he goes through even Beethoven's first symphony. Beethoven you know, begins with a dissonance, with a dominant seventh chord resolution to a tonic. Different dissonance, and finally gets into the key of the symphony. And in that book it said, uh, sounds like cats and dogs howling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, always, always contemporary music of any, even with pop music at first, it's, you know, it's like, a, you know, or a Dylan changing from folk songs to more religious things. It's always, you're always wrong. So you just have to decide you're going to do what you're going to do, and don't worry about the critics. Like, as a matter of fact, if a critic who you don't value criticizes you, you know you're in the right path. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if I guess, okay, I'll call it organized sound. And so this is all organized sound, or it's unorganized sound, depends how you think about it. Um, so th this is all working with electronics, uh, the one that you just heard. The one you're going to hear now is just the opposite. It's all pre-recorded sounds, which then the, the unusual technology of the Volensack machine then screws up.
sort of virtuoso piece. <laughs> this is just on one machine. <laughs> Um, but it was fantastic when it came, and sometimes it just recorded the, the noise of the machine itself. Uh, putting the tape in there and just recording, just raising that and just getting <laughs> kind of sounds. Um, and so this was, it, it was never done the way I wanted. By the way, I'm amazed. You know, I'm not, this is the first time I'm hearing this on such good speakers. <laughs> You're very spoiled, it's wonderful. <laughs> we never had speakers like this. <laughs> so the, the idea for this, piece was uh, a big flat the bed truck and a solo dancer performing and speakers in Central Park, you know, because we had there were hundreds of thousands of people there. We couldn't afford it. <laughs> so uh, it's never been done the way I wanted to do it. But this was uh, uh, a piece in, in support of the people of uh, Vietnam. Um, how do you hear the piece? What, uh, not, not so much like, dislike. Uh, do you have any sort of experience? I, I, I understand it now from later, years later. Could be heard as like uh, bombing. You know, it could be as bombing, a destructive yeah. thing. So, yeah. yeah? It's very deliberately grating. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of fruit of this going on in there. Yeah. There's also, um, for me, there's now that I listen to it. <laughs> As a as a um, person after all these years, is uh, uh, I'm not sure it was intentional, but the 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 court song is one thing, and the the, the and that's that's the uh, analogous to the capitalist society, uh, and then there's the the private flute song, and there is this thing going on and a breaking down, and finally it ends up with the brings with the court song and ends up with the flute song, maybe, maybe I don't know. There was this way of, uh, 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 as an offering to the people of Vietnam, I don't know. But it was this kind of, this thing being destroyed and then going through it and then this, the silences and then the finally getting to a more calm ending. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know what was on my head at that time, yeah. I was going to ask, were you trying to emulate radio silence at certain points because it seems very in keeping with the whole wartime scenario? Yeah, I guess that's another thing. You can just fool around with the radio and just rec record everything, especially shortwave radio. You can make a whole piece out of that, use that as a soft material, and sure, and 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 by breaking into silence. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, some of the kind of work I did back then. The first piece I don't have to play for you because we don't have that much time. Um, uh, then the next thing I did, which I didn't bring here, is working with sounds was, again, just pre-recorded sounds. No manipulation of sounds at all. It's a piece called The Seasons Vermont. It's uh, an hour-long piece. And each season I recorded the sounds of that season. And then I, I chose things and I made a um, uh, recording, continuous recording. And that's with an, an uh, instrumental ensemble. So that'll be some other time. Uh, but then in the 80s and um, 90s, I was working uh, it's still going on in the West German, the West German radio in Cologne. Uh, this fa it's a fantastic um, support system there. It's less now than when I was there, and the uh, they had this thing called Hirschbild. Hirschbild means like ear play, and that's pretty much like uh, could have been on the lowest level. Though I grew up with it, uh, you know the the shadow. Anybody? Could, uh, the shadow, only the shadow knows. When I was a child, these little vignettes on the radio, half hour, uh, or, or Superman, or um, some cowboy thing, or something like that, and I would listen to them. So that it wasn't. It was more like theater, kind of earplay. And then uh, there was a man, Klaus Scherning, who worked a lot with John Cage and other people, and then he opened up to more experimental uh, kind of work. And I did several pieces there. Uh, again, it's all working with, um, mm, yeah, I, I think all mine was then all pre recorded sounds. So, like, this is, uh, it's, a, it's too long to listen to all of it. It's a PC called, piece called Ishi Time Changing Spaces. So, maybe, Ricardo, if you want to put this one in. This is from uh, 1989. It's 20 minutes though, so we'll do the third try. Yeah. And uh, Ishii, do you know Ishii? No? Okay, good. I, 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 
serve some purpose in life. Um, <laughs> Ishii was uh, the last of the Yahi people in California. And uh, his people were pretty much wiped out. And then uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, there was only about four left. And finally, uh, there is only one left, and that was Ishii. Ishii is not his real name. It just means man or person, because you don't give your personal name. And uh, he came out of the woods, just gave himself up. And he was taken in by an anthropologist, uh, Alfred Kerber. This is at the uh, University of California, around San Francisco, I'm not sure which one. And near the end, of, he only lived for until about 1916, so he only lived for about another five or six years. And he recorded a lot of the songs of his people. And uh, so this is all made up of layers and layers and layers of that. Um, it's all collaged together, so there are maybe about seven layers of that. And then there's another layer which I'm singing and playing the violin in what I feel is related to that. And it, the only um, manipulation of the sound, uh, the, the engineers, usually you can't touch anything. You just tell them what you want. It's like you, if you work in a union theater here in North America, you can't even close the curtains. They have to call the union person to close the curtains. <laughs> So the same way there, but this I couldn't do. I said, no, you can't do this. I just very, very slowly uh, changed the you know, filtering of bringing out different overtones or whatever. So it's, it's constantly changing. But uh, I just had to sit there for uh, 20 minutes and just do this very slowly back and forth as I'm hearing things. And then it makes this kind of massive sound and in, in which then you can hear Ishii's voice. You can hear some other things too. And the thing to know also, by now you know I, know I like noise, because noise is just, all noise is, is a non-periodic sound. Yeah? So-called tonal stuff is just periodic sound. And the violin is the most, com or string instrument is the most complicated periodic sound. The flute is the simplest periodic sound. It's basically the fundamental and the first overtone, and that's it. So uh, noise is more complex, and I like things like that as well as tonal things. So the, um, uh, can I get at that with this, with the, uh, something to do with that. Yeah, it's just, it, it's constantly changing the, the uh, harmonic structure in terms of uh, uh, overtones, but it's, it's all endlessly changing my improvisation. Okay? Oh, yeah, oh, that's what I remember to say. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so what you'll hear some real noises also. Uh, so when Ishii was recorded, this is, some of you now know the large uh, uh, LP disc. But before that time, like uh, Enrico Caruso and the first recordings of uh, Louis Armstrong and stuff like that, there's, it's, a, it's a cylinder. And the cylinder just turns this way. And this is just, <coughs> the needle is just, uh, making the groove in the cylinder. So now these are recordings from 1915 or so. So you're going to get a lot of noise. And that's part of it because the name of the piece is um, Ishii uh, Time time Changing. Time Changing Spaces. Time Changing Spaces. Yes, so going from that space of time into this space of time, but also the sense of history and uh, what it's all about. We just listen to some of this 20 minutes. Ago. An account of the fate of souls in Fung's Ishii.
about half the piece. You can show it off here. Show. Yes, that's about half the piece. So you, at the beginning, I don't know if you heard, that was an announcer from that time. Uh, that's Ishii talking about the fate of souls. And then it goes into the singing. It's all songs like the, 
um, gambling songs and all kinds of s songs are mixed in there, about, I don't know how many, seven or 10 or 12 songs. And all the noises come off the, the old disc. I didn't add any noises to it. I just I made the bands and then the changing the filtering, made the layers and the, all the noises that were on there, they simply came out. That comes from my, my, uh, the racine pendant this or something that, yeah. When you were working those filters, did you have a general idea or it was kind of improvisation all along? Just when I dry it in, because okay. I never knew how it would all come out. Exactly, okay. <coughs> and when you would compose like the other two songs we listened to, now, 50 years later, you, you say you see a, a song structure, A, B, A, B, oh, yeah, yeah. but when you uh, created it, how did you know the song was over? Or how did you know, how did you... I'm an improviser. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Towards the end of what we heard, I thought I heard something being submerged in water. Do you know how you brought that about? Because that was off the, off the noises from the disc. Yes. Somebody goes, oh. and the engineer said, "Oh, uh, hey, Glostein, don't you want to? Oh, no, no, we leave that. Don't you want to take that, clean it up? No, no, no. I want all that. It's, but I'll tell you, Mike. It's interesting you say that. My experience." <coughs> My experience listening to this is going deep down into the ocean and just all these things, sounds and, and uh, whatever floating around me. It's like it's, like it's all it's, it's very live within a, a very deep space. So when you said uh, that water, <laughs> so, yeah, that's the way I hear the piece. I don't know how you hear it now. So, um, so this is the kind of more wor recent work I've done uh, working with recordings. Yeah? But it's, uh, Again, there's no electronics in this at all. Uh, it's just off the original this. I'll say I hear a lot of music that's going on now. I mean, the kind of music, not, not talking about pop music, I'm talking about your music, which I'm guessing is somewhere not like this, but in your world working with electronics. Huh? Um, even when I was working with electronics, I was listening to the first piece, I realized that how much it's related to my gesture on the violin. And I remember I was working with a new music ensemble at Dartmouth College, and one year uh, he was away and asked me to take over the studio. And I went back right away and I said, okay, we just, we're just going to do all your computer stuff, fine, but we're going to begin with a tape, and you're going to work with just recording, you know, just for a few sessions, and you have to cut and splice. And it's a very different relationship. Um, what I'm getting at is, I don't know anything about you, so don't take this personally, or take it personally. <laughs> uh, it's very easy just to push buttons, get interesting sounds. What is it, how does it relate to your life, your breathing, to your the gestures that you make in your life, to your love relationships, to anything? Um, is a, th this can turn out fantastic, much more interesting sounds than we could do at that time. But uh, the question to me is always to be in touch with uh, you as a human being, not just, oh, this is interesting. Uh, art doesn't interest me at all. People interest me. So um, maybe just keep in mind your, your physicality, your experiences, physical experiences, your other um, so that the, the whole body is participating. Like when I play the violin, the gesture was about to, if I make this gesture, it's one sound. If I make this gesture, it looks the same, but it's different. This has breath in it, and this is like this. That's all part of my music, yeah? So I, I don't tell you what to do, but I find it very useful to be in touch with us as a whole living being, rather than just our intelligence up here. That's all I can say because I don't know you at all. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs>